It's a pleasure to uh, speak to you all today, and I just want to start with a brief apology, and that is that um, this session was originally scheduled for Friday, and it got moved to Sunday. And what that translates into for me is that I have to run out of here immediately after my talk so that I can catch the train, so that I can catch a plane, and then I can uh, continue on with my travels. Um, so I apologize for anyone who might have been hoping to maybe chat a little bit afterwards. We won't be able to do that. I also want to apologize to the fellow speakers who are coming up after me because um, I would like to support them by being here. But I will say that the next speaker, Alan, uh, was recently, uh, I hosted him in Ashland, Oregon, where I put on a conference called Exploring Psychedelics. I had him there just last month, and I had him for a whole hour, so I had double the dose of Alan, so I'm, I'm very happy with that. And then also Oliver, who's going to be speaking in just a couple speakers. I've had him on my podcast several times, so I've had lots of Oliver. Uh, and my podcast is The Entheogenic Evolution, if anyone's curious. So if you want to chat with me, I'm really easy to get a hold of online and more than happy to answer any of your questions. Um, so also, this is only a half an hour, which uh, that's a little bit difficult for me. This is a big topic that I want to talk to you about today, so I'm going to try and cram in as much as I can, uh, but we'll see how that goes. So the talk is titled 5-MeO-DMT Energy, the Ego, and Non-Duality. So I'm going to try and hit all of these topics a little bit and tie them all together. <laughs> And we'll see how successful I am with that. Um, I'll start with 5-MeO-DMT. Um, many people are familiar with, quote, regular DMT, which is NN-DMT. Uh, but not a lot of people are really familiar with 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine, or 5-MeO-DMT. And there's a tremendous difference between these two different DMT forms. They're both endogenous to the human bioenergetic system, your, your neural system, meaning that your body produces both NNDMT and 5-MeO-DMT, along with all mammals on planet Earth. So these are endogenous tryptamines. And in addition to being found in mammals, they are present in many species of plants, grasses, and with 5-MeO-DMT, also quite uniquely in the venom of the Sonoran Desert Toad, or Bufo alvarius. Um, the distinctions between DMT and 5-MeO-DMT. If you were to smoke DMT, for example, that would last maybe 5 to 15 minutes. It would be very colorful, it would be very bright, um, kind of super high definition, technicolor, all kinds of things going on with DMT. Um, but that lasts for about 5 to 15 minutes. 5-MeO-DMT, by comparison, if you were just to smoke that and just one hit, perhaps, if you get enough, that will last anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes. Visually, uh, DMT, NN-DMT, tends to be much more visually active than 5-MeO-DMT. So we have Technicolor DMT, but 5-MeO-DMT tends to be visually like pure white light that is being refracted through an infinite fractal prism. So it kind of rainbows out, but it has this very white light quality to it. Also, another distinction, and this is the most important one, another distinction between DMT and 5-MeO-DMT. As I'm sure you're all aware, when people smoke DMT and experience that, they like to come back and talk about UFOs and aliens and machine elves and things like that. The most common response to people experiencing 5-MeO-DMT is not aliens and UFOs and machine elves, but God. Absolute unitary being, unitary consciousness, the fundamental nature of reality. So in my experience, in the way that I would categorize them, 5-MeO-DMT is far more powerful and, for my view, also far more significant than DMT because it can bring people more effectively than any other psychedelic medicine or entheogen into a unitary state of consciousness, or what's also called a non-dual state of being. And the experience for people who go through this, to quote Rack Razum in his film, what is it, Aya Awakenings, at the very end of the film, Rack gets to experience 5-MeO-DMT, 
And as soon as he's able to articulate language at the end of that experience, he says, it's it, it's it. Oh, I don't know what that is, but it's it. <laughs> and that's what 5-MeO-DMT is like. OK. So I'm going to switch up the order. Rather than go to energy, let's go to the ego. Um, 5-MeO-DMT is the most effective medicine that I know of for producing these non-dual states of awareness, of an absolute sense of unity. And mostly when we are operating in day-to-day -day consciousness, and honestly, with most entheogens as well, there is still a sense of duality that remains within the entheogenic experience. Um, so f the ego is what creates this sense of separation, this sense of individual self. So from the perspective of the ego, I am me, and I'm over here, and all of you are you, and you're all over there, and we're all individuals, and then we exist in this world that seems to be somewhat separate from us. Like, for example, I can go over and kick the door, and the door doesn't say, ow. Whereas, if Oliver were to come up here and kick me, I would say, ow, man, that hurts. Why did you kick me? So, I have this sense of being an individual that is separate both from other people and the objects that exist in the world. And this is what we call duality. There is the sense of subject and object, self and other. And from the perspective of the ego, this is what drives pretty much all spirituality and all religion. Because from the individual perspective is this, holy shit, I'm this little tiny insignificant individual. I'm in this great big universe. What the fuck is going on here? Who's in charge? What do I do? What's my purpose? What is the meaning? I'm so scared and alone. Okay, so that's the perspective of the ego. And that's what drives this spiritual quest. That's what drives religion. Um, organized religion comes in and says, oh, ego, you have questions. We have answers for you. It's all in this nifty little book or in this set of rituals or in these beliefs and these mythologies and you follow all these proper things and then you will be rewarded or you will achieve enlightenment or whatever it is that religion promises you. Spirituality is very similar where it says, oh, you want to grow and you want to enlighten yourself or whatever it is. So here's, here's a program, here's a path for you. And so most of that is responding to the needs of the ego because the ego through this self-awareness, we develop questions. They're kind of the questions that I just went through. Like, well, who am I? Where did I come from? What's the purpose? And so there's always this questing for answers that come with the ego. And this also seems to be what makes human beings unique on planet Earth, right? We share this planet with many, many other forms of life. But there isn't really any evidence that any of these other forms of life are pursuing either a religious or a spiritual practice. Meaning, you know, dogs and cats and dolphins and whales, they don't appear to have churches and holy texts and they don't have rituals they, per they perform. And, you know, they're not like human beings where they can go and shave your head and put on, you know, a nice unicolor outfit and say, hey, now I'm a monk and, you know, I'm working on enlightenment or something like that. So we are the ones that produce this. And this is also where all of human culture Art, technology, all of this comes through the human quest for meaning and identity and this sense of self and answering this question, who am I? Let's check the time here. Okay, we're doing, we're doing quite well. So the ego is producing this sense of separation, this sense of self-identity. And through my own experiences, I would characterize the ego as primarily a collection of dualistic energetic patterns. And what I mean by that is that, well, first let's just start with the human being. That I would like to identify human beings as beings of energy. You know, sometimes people get these rarefied notions of, well, a being of energy, of pure energy, is like floating around out there in the astral realms and it doesn't have a body, it's just zapping around and doing its thing. And I would disagree with that. I would say, well, the human being, or any living being, is a being of pure energy. And if you think about it, what do our sense organs do? Our sense organs receive energetic messages from our environment and translates that into a picture of self and the world. 
So it happens dualistically, that in creating my image of you, I'm creating my sense of self at the same time. And so I'm taking in energetic impressions of light, of sound, of tactile sensation and touch. All of these things are forms of energy. These are vibrations, which then our sense organs are translating into essentially a virtual reality, that I'm not actually seeing you. What I'm doing is I'm receiving light waves and then in my brain, I'm reconstructing an image of what I'm perceiving of the world. And most of the time that happens to function relatively well and so I can make my way around. And you know, if, if I think that there's a door there, there's probably a door there. And there's certain exceptions to that rule where maybe you're seeing things that aren't actually physically there. But for the most part, um, our sense organs are able to translate the energetic impressions that we receive from the world and create a relative facsimile of what's going on. And so we can all generally agree that I'm up here, you're over there, I'm wearing a blue shirt, whatever it is, that we're able to reconstruct this. Now, that's things coming from outside in. Now, from inside out, we also are beings of energy. Because what is thought if it's not energy. I mean, literally, you can hook yourself up to a little brain machine and you are producing waves of energy. And so we've got theta waves and alpha waves and beta waves, and that's just a form of energy. So thought is energy. Emotions also are energy. And so thoughts up here, emotions tend to center somewhere around here, around the heart, where we feel nervous and the heart beats fast. We're in love. Right? All of these are forms of energy that are expressing themselves. So we are this interface. That's what the self is, is an interface between energetic impressions that are coming from outside as well as energetic um, phenomena that are happening inside, which we can then choose to express outside. And that's what all communication is and interactions between humans and other beings and things like that. So it's all just energy just happening all the time. Now, what makes human beings different from other living beings? It, again, this is apparently, I'm just saying based on observation. Um, what makes human beings different is that we also have this ego that gets in the way with this sense of self, this self-awareness. And that's where we're different from other living beings is that other living beings don't appear to have the same sense of self that we have. They don't have the same sense of self-awareness. Um, I love my dog, so I always like to bring my dog up in talks. So my dog, Moxie, um, if she wants to bark, she barks. If she, so she feels an energy and woof, 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 she just lets it out. And something that she doesn't do is she doesn't say, hmm, did I say that right? I wonder if I sounded too much like a cat when I said that. <laughs> Did that really express my authentic self? Right? That doesn't work that way. Moxie, she gets excited, she barks. She's happy, she wags her tail. Right? She feels something and she acts on it. There's no editing process that takes place within my dog. She's just, she's right there, she's in the moment, she's happening, she's letting it out as she experiences it. Human beings, we do not do that. Because we feel something. And then we say, oh, how do I put this so that this other person likes me the best? Or I need to say this the right way. Or I'm really feeling angry, but, oh, spiritual people, they don't get angry, so maybe I shouldn't do that. Or, you know, there's all kinds of ways that we continually and constantly edit the natural energy that we feel because we want it to come out the right way. And the right way is defined by our culture, our society, our religion, our spiritual tradition, whatever it is. There are various ways that we are constantly, rather than just being present with ourselves and how we genuinely feel with that energy that we feel inside of ourselves, we're thinking, how do I let this out into the world in such a way that I will be accepted, that I will be liked, that I will be loved, that I will make other people feel good, or whatever it is. So unlike the dog, we don't just bark when we feel like barking, and we don't just wag our tail when we feel like wagging our tail. We're trying to think of the best way to do it, the proper way to do it. Now, as you might have experienced yourselves, I would imagine that you probably have, there are times where you do not say what you really think. 
Has anyone ever done that? Never, never. never. Of course not, because you're all authentic people. <laughs> See, that's just not the way that it goes with people. We feel something, we think something, and we don't express it the way that we actually feel it. And so society is based on lie upon lie upon lie upon lie so that we can all socially get along and interact with each other. Because maybe you think everybody else is an asshole, but you think, oh, I can't go around telling everybody they're an asshole because then no one will like me and then you know, the tribe will kick me out or whatever it is. So we're always going through this editing process. Sometimes that's benign doesn't really matter too much because then you go home and you tell your wife or your husband or whoever it is and it's like ah you know I really think Jim's an asshole and I'm just gonna let it all out now and sorry to bitch at you but I've just got to release it right so we we have ways that we can do that but when this builds up over time what happens is is we are creating an ongoing narrative of who it is that we think we are and how we should be through the ego through our sense of self and this is setting up dualistic distinctions. Well, I want to be like this, so I'm like this, but I'm not like that. I think these things, I don't think that. I uh, engage with other people this way, but not this way. And what that does is that creates energetic blocks within the human bioenergetic system. And this is one of the great things about working with psychedelics and working with entheogenic medicines. Because, like, you go and you drink your ayahuasca, and what happens? <sighs> I've been holding that one in for too long. All right? It takes where we are blocked and helps it get out. And then we feel better. We're like, oh, damn, I feel good now. I'll just dance all night or whatever it is that you need to do. Um, okay, we're still doing all right. So, now let's talk about the energy of 5-MeO-DMT. So, I consider 5-MeO-DMT, 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine, this is the top of the line, this is the champagne, this is the crown jewel. In my experience, there is nothing out there in the entheogenic world that even touches 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine. So, Let's say you have a sufficient dose. And there is a difference between kind of a dabble your toes in dose of 5-MeO-DMT, which I think is kind of worthless, is kind of a waste of your time and a waste of medicine. If you're going to do it, take enough. Don't just try and dip your toes in the water. Go throw yourself in the deep end and let yourself drown. That's where you want to be because that's where the most effective work is going to get done. So. Let's say you have an effective dose of 5-MeO-DMT, and it varies from the individual. Some people need a little, some people need a lot. It also really varies if you have free base form, if you have the salt form, or if you're working with Sonoran Desert Toad Venom. It's all quite different in terms of how much you actually need to use. But we'll just say you get a, quote, release dose. And if you have enough, you take that hit. And I like to demonstrate this. So, this is the face of someone who has experienced psychedelics. Maybe they're, they're well experienced with psychedelics, but they've never had 5-MeO-DMT before. Okay? So they're taking their hit, and here's their face. First it's, ah. And you get that, that look of recognition like, oh yeah, I'm tripping. And then, <laughs> okay? That's an effective dose of 5-MeO-DMT. In other words, within a matter of seconds, it escalates far beyond what you have previously experienced. So one of the ways I like to describe it is that you go from zero to infinity within one breath. And if you haven't experienced that, I'm not trying to be rude, you have no idea what I'm talking about. This is something, if you've experienced you can say, oh yeah, oh, I know what you're talking about. But literally, you cannot conceive of what this experience is because every thought you have is operating from the dualistic ego-based mode. The ego is saying, this is this, that is that, okay? You can't describe this experience effectively, but one way that I would say is that 
there's this feeling of energy is expanding, 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 and as soon as you think it can't possibly get any bigger, it gets many orders of magnitude much larger within a number of seconds. Now, these limited energetic structures of the ego, this is what makes it so beautiful and effective, is that with most entheogenic medicines, what happens is these structures of the ego, they start to get challenged and they break apart, but then they go and they reconfigure back over here. And then the, ener the energy from the uh, entheogen starts to open up again and, they go and then the ego reconstructs. And so mostly the, the ego tends to be present with entheogenic medicines. But with 5-MeO-DMT, it's so powerful that from the perspective of the ego, within a matter of seconds says, oh my god, I'm dying, because it's being overwhelmed. Now, in a positive situation, the ego says, oh my god, I'm dying. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, and you go for it, and the ego just goes boop, and it falls away, and what you're left with is nothing but God, everywhere, all the time, for eternity. And that, I would argue, is your true identity. It's not who you think you are. So when I look out in this room, I see a bunch of people. I only see one being. Each and every one of you is God, as is the floor, the ceiling, the light, every breath, every thought, every moment. That's all that exists. There is only God forever. And the ego is this little mask that comes in and says, no, 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 I'm me, I'm me, I'm me, I'm so me, I'm really, really me. Mm, I'm sorry, no, no, you're not. But you get to enjoy the illusion of being you. You have one human lifetime to enjoy that illusion of who it is that you think that you are. So make the most of it, my loves, make the most of it, because this is what you've got. Now, if you can do this, if you can just boop, get rid of the ego, then all that shit you've been carrying around inside of you, blah, it comes right out, and it's the most amazingly beautiful thing. And man, I'm really running out of time, but I'll just demonstrate, if someone's really ready to pop, see, everybody's got something that they need to release, so it's usually not clean. Okay, but I'll show you what happens. When someone really pops with 5-MeO-DMT, first of all, the body goes into fluid symmetrical movements. The left and right sides of the body always mirror each other and they start doing this. And people, from their ego perspective, they have no idea that their body is doing this. And then they're purging and then their hands come up and they're rubbing it all over themselves and it's, it's like, it's like a sexy shampoo commercial, you know, when you're in the shower, oh yeah. And they smear it all over themselves. And I've got to tell you, it's the most beautiful thing in the universe because what's happening in that moment is that someone is taking out all this repressed energy that they've had inside them, something that they were ashamed of, something that they thought was ugly, something that they thought was disgusting, something that they thought that they needed to hide, and it's coming out and they're realizing, it's God too, and it's all beautiful, and there's only love, there's only love, and I love it, and I love myself, and I love everything, and I love everyone. And that is why 5-MeO-DMT is the top of the line. <laughs>